You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You are now entering the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, a show that uncovers what's fact, what's fake, and what's fun in the crazy world of pseudo archaeology. Hello and welcome to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 146. And tonight, Amelia Earhart, has her plane been found or not? Or maybe? The answer is maybe. Okay, so why have I chosen to do Amelia Earhart on today of all days? Well, for a couple different reasons. First, I do have, as I've alluded to before, listeners, a secret list of possible themes that I would do for this show. And and I just I write things down every so often. You know, I think of things or I see something online or on TV or whatever. I'm like, ooh, ooh, that would make a good show. Right. And Amelia Earhart has been on there for like, I don't know, a, a year and a half or something. But. What has pushed me forward to bring Amelia to the forefront is actually a television show that I have been a part of called Strange and Suspicious. And it's a little half an hour show that is done by the people of TMZ. And it's on the Fox network. And I've spent the last month recording episodes with the rest of my cast. There's there's 10 of us who talk about these various strange and suspicious stories. You know, they may be sort of who done it crimes. It may be sort of unexplained kind of things and so on. I think you guys get the the theme to this. Anyway, it's been a hoot and a half to uh to be a part of. I've really enjoyed my time there. Harvey Levin is the host and it's just gone really, really well. I know that you want secret, angry and cruel things that I could tell you about the other people, how I stormed off set in my anger. But I just don't got any of those stories, you guys. Unfortunately for you, it was actually a really fun, really cool shoot. And I I even miss those guys and wish that I was still working on the show. The show may or may not go forward from here, right? We did a month worth of shooting and it'll be on TV. And depending on how things go, we'll make more of them or we won't. You know, that such is life in the in the fast paced biz of Hollywood, my friends. But one of the topics we did was Amelia Earhart. And in reading through the Amelia Earhart beat sheet, I guess you would call it, we get we get little beat sheets kind of behind the scenes, you know, of like, hey, you're going to talk about this. Here's kind of the facts of the case, right? Just to sort of freshen us up on what we're going to talk about. And as I was looking at the Amelia Earhart beat sheet, I was like, oh, dude, Amelia Earhart, I've been meaning to do this for the Pseudo Archaeology podcast, man. So I, I, I'm sort of getting two for one today, listeners. I was able to talk about this on the Strange and Suspicious show And uh, I get to dive a little deeper here on this podcast because for the little vignettes that we do on Strange and Suspicious, you know, they only last like maybe two or three minutes. Right. And I can stretch out here for as long as I want. Talk about Amelia Earhart as much as I feel like doing it, which could be a lot. Beware. So the reason why I think Amelia Earhart appeared on my list And the reason why I think the producers of Strange and Suspicious thought about doing Amelia Earhart was because there's been some new information coming out on the search for Amelia Earhart's plane. And I know as soon as you hear me say that, you're like, King Kellerman, enough with your Amelia Earhart BS. It's like every year they're coming out with some new thing. Oh, is that the sole of her shoe? Oh, is that a picture of her on a Japanese fishing boat? You know, and and I know, I feel your pain that a lot of a lot of that stuff has been very much debunked or it has come from sources that aren't that great or it comes from an overall ideology that isn't that good to begin with. I'll dive a little bit deeper into the possibilities 
in a little bit. But before I get into the exciting new research, which it truly actually kind of is exciting new research. What's the deal? What's the deal with Amelia Earhart? Okay, so Amelia Earhart is known for her last flight, right? On July 2nd, 1937, they lose radio contact with Amelia Earhart's plane. And basically through the late spring and early summer of 1937, what she's been trying to do is be the first woman to pilot an airplane around the world, right? She starts in Oakland, California. And I know this because doubly so, because I grew up quite close to the Oakland airport. And whenever you fly to Oakland, you can see little, they have little like dioramas and and little showcases of, you know, Amelia Earhart at the airport. So it's like this hometown story for me. But she she leaves from from Oakland going east, right? So she's going to fly across the United States, then across the Atlantic, across Europe, right into Asia and so on. She's going that way. So she's actually by this point in July, she's most of the way done. All that's left is to cross the Pacific Ocean, which is like the hardest part, saving the hardest part for last. And it's just her and her navigator, Fred Noonan, right? Just those two guys in her Lockheed Electra plane, a very famous, very unique and kind of specific looking plane. If you guys have seen any like newsreels of Amelia Earhart or this kind of thing, you've seen the plane, that silver looking, really sleek, you know, very almost art deco, 1930s, very cool looking, looking plane. Again, very unique, very specific. If you, if you kind of find it, you find it. They're not a ton of Lockheed Electras all over the place. So, which of course, also tells you that that it's the ultimate artifact to find. You know, if you're trying to solve the Amelia Earhart mystery, you must find the plane. It is the singular piece that would that would add the most information in an attempt to solve the mystery. OK, so at this point, their last airport that they're taking off from is in New Guinea. And what they're trying to do, if you picture this in your mind, they're in they're in New Guinea, which is which is on the western side of the Pacific Ocean, right? Sort of on the, the western edge of the Pacific Ocean. New Guinea, right, right above Australia. And she's gonna she and, and Noonan are gonna fly from there to Howland Island. And then from ha- the idea is from Howland Island, would they would then go to Hawaii and then home, right? That's it. Those are the last couple steps. But this in many ways is the worst one, right? taken off from New Guinea and you're just shooting for a tiny little island, Howland Island in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific, right? This is the shaky, shaky part of the whole thing. So she does indeed take off from New Guinea and start going toward Howland Island. And then she's never heard from again. But there is a little bit more to it than that. So on July 2nd, right, at, she is approaching Howland Island. We can say she is getting close. She's actually getting damn close. And how we know this is there are radio operators on various boats and ships, you know, around ha- Howland Island. And they're all listening to Amelia Earhart's transmissions, right? And she's transmitting about coming closer to Howland Island and she's transmitting her like her degree readings of of which direction she's going and this kind of thing. And the transmissions are becoming really, really crystal clear, which is a really good sign, right? The boats like right next to Howland Island are like, oh, my God, the transmission's really, really clear. It was so clear, in fact, that the crew on one of the ships, I think it was the Atasca. I am not 100 percent sure, but the, the Atasca was indeed a a U.S. Coast Guard cutter that was in the vicinity to help with the with the flight. But the ship heard her radio signal coming in so clear that the crew got up on deck to see the plane because this is a super famous thing. Oh, my God. Amelia Earhart is flying over this area. We want to see the plane. So just the fact that the crew would get out on deck to see the plane, it tells you that the plane had to have been close, right? had to have been close to Howland Island. Again, the ship is is like 
is moored right off of Howland Island. But they never see it. They never see the plane. It, and that must mean that it was just out of sight and just out of range in terms of hearing the engines, right? They were so close. They had to be, right? That's really, really good evidence. Really good evidence of, of Amelia Earhart's last moments. Now, based on that, by far the best guess of what happened is Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan were kind of going back and forth, trying to find Howland Island, knowing they were close. And then they just finally ran out of gas and crashed into, into the Pacific, right? And then the plane sank and they, you know, they may have been killed in the crash or knocked unconscious in the crash or injured in the crash. Tough to say. This is, this is also, we must remember, a crash of a Lockheed Electra in the 1930s. This is not like like a 747 crash, right? We're talking about much slower speeds. When a plane like that runs out of gas, they they can ditch it in the in the ocean and not just obliterate the plane, right? I'm not saying I would want to do it. I am saying the crash would still be violent, but don't think of it again as being like a 747 crash that just like hits the you know, hits the ocean and just splinters into a million pieces. It's not like that. I would think of it more like all those water landings that you see in like World War II footage, you know, where the where a fighter gets gets shot and they're forced to make a water landing. Those planes tend to land in the water. OK, you know, meaning vaguely in one piece, which is also where I do think that the that the Lockheed Electra, even though the passengers in it might have been bounced around pretty terribly, the plane itself is likely in one good piece, right? It could have done something as severe as done like a cartwheel or something on the on the ocean surface, but not not obliterate. So in terms of archaeology or in terms of figuring out the story, that is a good thing, right? The idea that the plane is likely largely still together, but unfortunately, they were never heard from again. And your best guess is that the plane is way 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 deep down off the coast of Howland Island and that is the very best place to look for any answers to the mystery of Amelia Earhart when we come back a bit of the backstory on Amelia Earhart Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 146. And we have been talking about Amelia Earhart. And I thought I would take a moment and talk a bit about the backstory of Amelia Earhart. Like, who is this Amelia Earhart person anyway? Well, she was born in 1897, to give you an idea of, you know, of her age. When she disappeared, she was almost 40 years old. I think she was a couple of weeks away from her 40th birthday. And, you know, Amelia Earhart grew up in a, I think you, you could say sort of a quite wealthy family. She was on, she was on that side of the tracks, you know, on the good side. And she got her pilot's license in 1923, right? And she was only like the 16th female to get a pilot's license in the United States, right? Number 16. Good for her. After that, we have to remember that she ran in like kind of the really high end circles, right? She originally rises to fame in 1928 when she becomes the first woman to cross the Atlantic in a plane, not flying a plane, sitting in a plane. And I know you're kind of like, uh, okay. But but I guess for 1928, that was a thing. I will say to Amelia Earhart's credit, you know, she she basically said, hey, man, look, I was just like a sack of potatoes in the back. OK, I was just sitting there. But no matter what, that was her first kind of taste of fame and promotion, you know, and that kind of that kind of deal. And so that started her on a trajectory that, let's face it, ultimately leads to her downfall. We have to be a bit honest about what happens. You know, I, I will say that after that 1928 thing, she does start to do things for herself. Right. She'll set if you look at 
Amelia Earhart's statistics throughout the 1930s, you're going to see things like she sets altitude records, you know, and it's so funny. Some of the some of the numbers like the altitude records are are things like ooh, 18,000 feet. And when we realize that that modern jets cruise at like, you know, 35,000 feet or this kind of thing. You know, the fact that somebody could just make it up to 16 or 18, you know, was a big thing in the 30s. But she did. She did that. She married George Putnam in 1931, who was again a very well-known sort of rich promoter kind of guy. She was very pro women's rights and and also had a like a like a close friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt. It's pretty crazy. See, again, she's cruising in these high, high class, high status arenas. Right. I do think. This is just me guessing, but I do think that she enjoyed the spotlight. You know, I do think she liked being promoted as sort of that, you know, woman of the air, you know, that that kind of thing throughout throughout the 30s. But there is something here that's a bit of a bummer, but does need to be said Many sources tend to angle and indicate that she wasn't that great of a pilot, you know, and I'm not here to say she was a terrible pilot. I'm here to say she was an okay pilot, right? Just based on some of the some of the like things that happened in some of her earlier flights and this kind of thing in the aviation industry of the time, I think she was a bit looked down on. The reason for her success is, of course, that she cruised around in these very high elite areas. She was she was good looking, you know, uh, for the era. There were other female pilots that were better than her, you know, but they didn't get the coverage. You guys might have heard names like Poncho Barnes, Beryl Markham, Jackie Cochran. These are these are all women of the 30s who were excellent pilots, likely way better than Amelia Earhart. But for whatever reason, they weren't as attractive as Amelia Earhart or didn't have as much money as Amelia Earhart. Or I would say the no, one of the number one things didn't have the same kind of connections, right, that Amelia Earhart does. So they were not they were not covered in the same way. Amelia Earhart got the got the posters, you know, got the likes, got the subscribers in the 1930s. So I think as the 1930s rolled on, I think that the public might have even gotten a little a little tired of Amelia Earhart. So she had to do something big. Right. And I do think she, she I do think she dug the spotlight. And I think she was like, OK, we're going to do this round the world thing. And again, not, I, I'm always torn. I, I hate talking negative about people. You guys, I really do. You know, I I do want to be honest and say that it really does look like Amelia Earhart was not the world's greatest pilot, but she did do some other things that were very awesome and 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 a fair ball. While she just was a sack of potatoes in 1928, crossing the Atlantic in 1932, she did become the first female to solo across the Atlantic. Right. So she did fly her own plane across the Atlantic in 1932. Right. And did what Lindbergh did several years before, right? So she 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 deserves that, you know. Good for her. I haven't flown a plane solo across the Atlantic, you know. She did that, but by the time you get to the later thirties, and she's going to do what amounts to, you know, a big huge stunt, she's just in over her head, man. You know, it's just too much. And what's funny, the more the more research I did on this, a lot of this stuff I already knew, but but there were certain things like I I had not known or forgotten that the around the world flight originally a couple months before they started it, they tried to go the other way. Like like they were going to go West instead of East still starting in Oakland, but their first trip was going to be Oakland to Hawaii. Right. And they did it like they did go Oakland to, to Hawaii and made it, but there was a mess up with her plane in Pearl Harbor, right in Hawaii. And it may have had to do with her doing a crappy landing it's again, I can't say for sure that there were there were witnesses that said, oh, a tire popped or, you know, that it could be just that the, there was something wrong with the plane. But it could also be that she didn't land it very well. So it's it, the, the truth on that is lost time. But either way, they had to scrap that original start of around the world going west 
they started again a couple months later in 1937, right going east this time. And it, there were some real reasons for that. Like some of the prevailing winds had changed a bit and it would be slightly easier to go east. So that's why they, you know, changed that around, which it, it's one of those things, you know, if she had started something as simple as going going west instead, where her first her first stops would have been Hawaii and then Howland Island and then onward that way everything she might have made it you know what i mean like to get those get the worst parts out of it earlier when you're fresh who knows but but uh that that i think in many ways would be the smarter call right to see if you can get that howland island leg out of the way who knows this is one of those crazy moments in history did everything change just because amelia Earhart made a a poor landing in honolulu you know, months before having to change everything around. Who knows? But however it goes, we all know where it ends up, right? Now, of course, ever since 1937, this is, do we want to call it one of the top 10 mysteries, you know, in, in, of the 20th century? Maybe. And you might be like, Hey, can kill a man, all this time you're talking about Amelia Earhart. How does that go with archaeology? I thought this was a pseudo archaeology podcast. Can Kelly, what's wrong with you talking about Amelia Earhart? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you what. It does fit for a couple reasons, because guess why? Now, a question I get all the time is like, how old does something have to be for it to be archaeological? Take this, losers. 50 years. Yeah, yeah. Once something's 50 years old or older, it can be considered archaeological. So, yeah, the Lockheed Electra plane, boom, it's in my territory now. Ha, ha, I say. See what I'm saying? It, and, I, and I know you're like, dude, 50 years, what? I got like pants older than that. Archaeology, give me, give me a break. Now, and honestly, we as archaeologists feel that way too. We're not, we're not here to be like... You know, I have to uh, rope off your backyard because you actually have a swing set back there that is 53 years old. It's it's not like that, you guys. This this just has to do with very sort of bureaucratic paperwork, you know, aspects of 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 archaeology. And and believe me that that stuff that's like 60 years old or something is usually not cared about whatsoever, except in cases like this, right? Something like Amelia Earhart's plane is something that is intrinsically interesting and historically important and that kind of stuff. So, yes, it does count as an archaeological exploration. It does. And same same with like uh, sunken ships from World War II or something like that. You know, they do count as archaeological relics and that kind of thing. So it does fall into into my world. And I will also add, that whether it be like God, how old is the is the Electra now? Is it uh, eighty seven years old or something like that? Whether something be eighty seven years old or three hundred years old, the the techniques and equipment used to find these things is the same, right? The skill set is the same, paperwork the same, right? So actually, I'm totally cool with covering Amelia Earhart on the pseudo archaeology podcast. Oh, and your second question, you're like, Hey, can Kelly so far, this sounds pretty straightforward. Where's the pseudo aspect loser. And I'm like, you just wait friend. Cause check this out. When we return thoughts on what happened to Amelia Earhart. Hello and welcome back one more time to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 146. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and we have been discussing what happened to Amelia Earhart. And so I thought we could do a little switcheroo and now talk about what are the most likely possibilities. And really, there's three categories for this. Possibility number one. She crashed into the ocean somewhere near Howland Island. That is by far the most likely scenario, you guys, by far, right? It just all data points to that. Two, you guys might have heard this one, that 
that she actually made it to this other island called Gardner Island, or you, you probably more often will hear it referred to as uh, Nicumaroro Island, right? This island is hundreds of miles away from Howland. Like, what? You know, but the idea that she somehow landed on the coral reef r- right at that island and, and she and Fred were basically castaways and they ultimately died there. Right. That's that's the second one. There's a group that refers to themselves by the acronym Tigar. They're all over that one. And then the third possibility is like, oh, she was picked up by the Japanese or she's living under a, an assumed name in the United States, right? That, and that's, the, of course, the truly crazy, no data whatsoever one. Now, I think that you guys over the years, if you're into Amelia Earhart at all, you'll hear things like, did they find her shoe? A few years back, there was like a, um, a sole of a, of a shoe. I, and I think it was found on Nicomororo Island, right? And every so often, too, they'll find like, some human bones or something and be like, ah, yes, there remains again on, on Nicomaroro Island. Right. But all, Oh, and you'll even hear like, Oh, a piece of the plane question mark. But all of that stuff has basically been debunked. Right. It's really, really weak. And the problem with all that, and of course, I won't even go into the like, ah, oh, she's living under an assumed identity in Ohio. You know, no, she's not. Right. We all know that. But every every mystery like this has those silly things or that she was picked up by the Japanese. Like, no, you guys might have seen those photos. And of course, they're always these splotchy out of focus photos. Is that them on a Japanese port in 1937? No. Right. There's just. There's no good evidence for that. Again, I I love mysteries like this, you know? I want them to be solved, but I want them to be solved using good data, right? And none of this stuff is any good, you guys. The reason why, I'm telling you now, the Gardner Island slash uh, Nicomororo Island hypothesis even has any traction is because they've spent a decent amount of time basically beachcombing, right? Looking over the island for evidence But I got to tell you guys, that's the easy way out. You know, now any research is hard and any research takes time. But honestly, you know, the idea of just buying a plane ticket to Nicomororo Island and beachcombing for a few weeks looking for stuff. Yeah, you know, or looking for, oh, maybe the parts of the plane out on the reef. That's actually pretty easy, right? You don't need to dive. You don't need to look thousands of feet under the water. You know, you don't need very high end sonar equipment. You just kind of walk around and do some looking. So part of the reason, again, of the focus on that stuff is just it's easy. It's doable. You know, you can you can do it on your free time. But I'm really not impressed with what they found. I wish them well. I mean, if it turns out that They find real evidence. Great. I'm the first one to be like, good for you. That's awesome. But we have to be cold and harsh and scientific, friends. You know, the reason why you tune in in the first place, because you're cold and harsh and scientific. At least that's what all your friends tell you. And we got to look at what is the most possible explanation. It is that the plane is at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And unfortunately, in the area where it sank, it's like it's like over 16,000 feet deep. Just to give you a feel for that, the Titanic is at like 12,000 and change. Deeper than the Titanic. It's such a bummer. But the reason why the whole Amelia Earhart thing has gotten back on our radar, see how I do that? Back on our radar. I know, I know. Uh, you love it. You love it. Is that uh, there's this group called Deep Sea Vision and there's this guy who runs it, the CEO, uh, Tony Romeo. And at the end of uh, 2023 and into 2024, they did some deep sea sonar of the area where Amelia Earhart's plane went down. Right. And this takes money and time and it's slow and methodical. Right. This this isn't beachcombing. 
on an island. This is sitting on a boat, hoping that very high end equipment doesn't break and taking days and days and days to get decent sonar maps. Right. I've been on projects like this before where you're using very expensive, very temperamental equipment in harsh situations. And that's exactly what this deep sea sonar stuff is. Now, realize in looking for Amelia Earhart's plane, they're not sending divers down or something. This is this is just an unmanned. It's not even an ROV yet. It's really just a sonar torpedo. It kind of looks like a torpedo. And they're getting imagery of the ocean floor and in this area they did end up with an image right the deep sea vision team did end up with an image that is about the right size and right shape of the lockheed electroplane and i think it's fascinating i think it's really cool i give these guys oh man i give these guys a, a round of applause and a sturdy clap on the back you know good for them it could be nothing but they are looking in an area where it's a lot of like abyssal plane, meaning there's just not much down there. So anytime you get like a sonar hit, it's something. It Could it just be some rocks? It could, but they're looking in the right place. Like this is how it's done. And to give you guys some context, there have been other underwater archaeological finds of the last couple years that you guys I never thought they would find like if you look back to things like the the two ships the Erebus and the Terror from the 1846 Franklin expedition and this is near the North Pole right this is in that area I never thought they would find those they found both of them you know and to add insult to injury to me I never thought they would find Ernest Shackleton's ship the Endurance which sank in the 19 teens right this this time on a on a voyage to Antarctica I never thought they'd find that. They found those, man. It's a matter of time. If they just keep being careful, right? How many stories in archaeology are like this, where ultimately it's just about slow, methodical research? I mean, that's how they found King Tut's tomb, right? Slow, methodical research in Valley of the Kings, right? So this is it. I don't know, man. I'm just like, I'm really jazzed. Maybe I'm too jazzed. Maybe I've done what you're not supposed to do in this, which is fall in love. But I just I watched an extended interview with Tony Romeo and he just the dude just really seemed to be reasonable. He seemed honest. He didn't seem like an over the top braggart, which a lot of these guys can be. Sometimes he didn't seem like that. He was very matter of fact. He was just like, hey, man, this is what we're doing. This is what we're hoping to find. This is how our project's moving forward. Like, I was like, I was really positively taken aback by him. I was like, oh, good, dude. If anyone's going to find it, it's going to be these guys. What is a bit sad about this find in all its awesomeness is some of the other people who were looking like on, you know, Nicomororo Island immediately poo-pooed this find. You know, and, you know, it's just because they're jealous. I mean, I'm like, dude, suck it up. Be happy for these guys. You know, the you know, the team that actually used the tough, hard, slow, scientific way and actually found something like really, really promising. They immediately poo poo it. And then they're like, oh, yeah, but believe this photo from 1937 of Amelia Earhart in Japan. It's like, oh, come on, man. Oh, no, but believe this, like sole of a shoe yeah yeah a sole of a shoe found on an island yeah it's got to be amelia Earhart's. couldn't be anybody else you know it's just oh what a bunch of it's just crappy data dude oh, so in the end though you know it's it's a crazy story man it's a bit tragic it's always been interesting i wish the deep sea vision team the best they're going back they're going back, I think, at the end of 2024, early 2025 with an ROV. They'll take like better camera down there, you know, and just try and get a better, better image of, of what it is they found. And, and I, I'm guardedly optimistic, man. This might be it, right? 87 years on and they actually figure it out. I think that would be great. And you know what? I'm going to make you guys a bet, listeners. I think that if this sonar image ends up being nothing. If it ends up being a pile of rocks, I think that the deep sea vision team, if they keep 
doing what they're doing. You know, once a year they go back and they do a little more, a little more scanning. I think that Amelia Earhart's plane will be found for sure within five years. I definitely do. I think, you know what? If we're all a bit healthy, if we eat a good diet, we can live the next couple of years, my friends, and really see the end to the mystery of Amelia Earhart. And with that, I'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks for listening to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast. Please like and subscribe wherever you like and subscribe. And if you have questions for me, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, feel free to reach out using the links below or go to my YouTube channel, Kinkella Teaches Archaeology. See you guys next time. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.